you may hail i'm your host john bruni welcome to the focus where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world each episode we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community in this episode we're going to be looking at the war in gaza to help unpack this topic, we are joined by Professor Kenneth Roth. Kenneth is the Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Fellow at the Princeton School for Public and International Affairs. He served for nearly three decades as the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, one of the world's leading international human rights organizations. But before we start, a shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to find us. And by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Kenneth, welcome to The Focus. Very good to be here, John. Kenneth, in a piece written by yourself and Annie Sparrow for Foreign Policy in early February, and I quote, since Hamas's horrific October 7 attack, Israel has repeatedly targeted healthcare facilities, ambulances, and access roads in Gaza, end quote. However, according to the IDF and defenders of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, these are legitimate targets considering Hamas is alleged to be using Gazan health facilities, assets and infrastructure for tactical advantage. Considering the October 7 attack, is the IDF justified in targeting Gazan health facilities and infrastructure if they indeed are part of Hamas's tactical operations? Well, John, let me um, begin first by saying, obviously, the October 7th attack was, was horrible. These were blatant war crimes. You know, Israel um, is entitled to defend itself. So, you know, that's not in question. The question is, how does Israel defend itself? And what we've seen through various aspects of its military operation in Gaza is that it is not complying with international humanitarian law, basically the Geneva Conventions and the protocols that set forth the rules that are designed to spare civilians as much as possible the hazards of warfare. And we can get into various aspects of it, the indiscriminate bombardment, the, the use of bombs that have disproportionate consequences for civilians, um, the use of starvation as a weapon of war. Those are all war crimes. But your question focuses on the hospitals. And, and let me really begin by answering you by um, referring to an article that um, just was published in The Guardian, describing a visit to Gaza by American and British doctors who had volunteered to try to help. And they um, decried what they described as the Israeli military's systematic efforts to destroy Gaza's health infrastructure. And they thought you know, they were doing this really to try to render Gaza unlivable, one of the various things they're doing, in order to drive Palestinians away. And that's, you know, one of the goals that at least the right wing members of Netanyahu's cabinet articulate. And so, um, you know, in some cases, yes, there's been Hamas presence, but that's actually not the end of the story. You know, for example, with Al-Shifa Hospital, um, what had been, you know, Gaza's largest hospital, um, the IDF went in and took over the hospital, basically shut it down for a period. And then they came out and said, look it, here were a few guns, here was a tunnel. And what it showed was basically Hamas had been there in the past. It didn't show any ongoing presence. More to the point, it didn't really address the cost benefit analysis that is required under the humanitarian law rule of proportionality. And what that rule is, that is even if something is a legitimate military target and a hospital you know, can become a legitimate military target if it's being actively used for military purposes. But even in that case, you need to weigh the concrete and direct military advantages 
against the anticipated civilian cost. And you can imagine what the civilian cost is of depriving Palestinian civilians of health care in the middle of a war, in the middle of this you know, bombardment that has killed you know, an estimated 30,000 plus people. You know, many, many people don't die immediately, but rather they, you know, are injured. They need medical care. Then there are all the people who just need day-to-day -day medical care. You know, women who are giving birth, people who are on cancer treatment, you know, people who are on dialysis. All of this is shut down. And, and what these um, you know, American and British doctors have described, what, what the World Health Organization has now described, is that, you know, there are, um, or there had been 36 hospitals in Gaza. Today, the WHO says none of them is fully functional. About a dozen are partially working. Um, the others have been destroyed. Um, but in addition to um, just the shutting down of these hospitals, the Israeli military has also seemingly deliberately destroyed a lot of the basic equipment, you know, gratuitously. And so what this comes down to is it's not enough for Israel to say, oh, Hamas was there. You know, you still need to look at um, is the shutting down of the hospital, is the destroying of the hospital justified under this proportionality analysis? And, you know, how you get to a justification that has shut down completely two thirds of Gaza's hospitals and left one third limping along, it's very difficult to come to a justified conclusion. And what this all seems to be, as I said, is, is part of this effort to collectively punish the Palestinian civilian population, ideally to drive it out of Gaza, another Nakba, um, but at least to make civilians pay the price, which Netanyahu seems to think is a legitimate way to negotiate with Hamas. You know, Hamas is a military dictatorship. They obviously don't care about the Palestinian civilian population. Um, but you know, nonetheless, Netanyahu is saying, if we can starve Palestinian civilians, if we can deprive them of medical care, this gives us you know, a bargaining chip with Hamas to try to get our hostages back. And that is utterly wrong. That's a war crime approach to negotiation. Yeah. You know, just listening to what you say, uh, there seems to be very much an agenda here. And I think that you touched on it, you know, the idea of perhaps triggering another Nakba, another exodus of Palestinians out of Palestinian land in order to simplify um, Israel's security situation well at least as far as the right wing um of the israeli uh, knesset is concerned now do you think that this is really more an indirect consequence of what's happened or do you think that the war is really a deliberate act of such monumental catastrophe that it is designed specifically to denude gaza of its palestinian population well it depends you know whom you talk to yeah. Um, and obviously, there will be you know some generals in the military who are reasonable straight shooters who are simply saying no, we're responding to Hamas and we're fighting Hamas and that's all we're doing. But if you look at you know particularly the far right ministers in Netanyahu's cabinet, uh, who are not irrelevant figures by any means, because people like Smotrich and Ben Giver control eleven seats in the Knesset. Um, Netanyahu has a majority of four. Yeah. So these people determine whether Netanyahu stays in power. If he doesn't stay in power, his corruption case is resumed and he's facing likely prison. So they have leverage over him. And these people have been very upfront about the desire to have another month to you know, expel two point some million Palestinians into Egypt. Egypt doesn't want them. For various reasons, you know, it doesn't want to be a party to another, you know, massive war crime of forced deportation. It also has its own security problems in the northern Sinai. It doesn't want to compound it by having, you know, Hamas walk in there. But um, this is explicitly what some members of Netanyahu's cabinet want. And you know, who knows what Netanyahu wants other than to stay in power? But the effect is that he is, you know, basically pursuing their strategy. And it, it, it's hard to understand what. The Israeli military is doing in Gaza without you know, understanding this kind of broader demographic goal. Because if you look today at you know, the population of the territory of Israel and Palestine from the river to the sea, 
you know, treated as one country, the so-called one state reality that has effectively become because of the settlements. The population there between Jews on the one hand and Palestinians on the other is split pretty much 50-50. And, you know, it's very unclear what the Israeli government wants to do with that. Obviously, the best step would be the two-state solution, just allow an independent Palestine. And then, you know, a large number of the Palestinians, Palestinians go into that state. Israel maintains its Jewish majority within Israel proper. Um, that's not what Netanyahu wants. He's kind of dead set against the Palestinian state. So then it comes down to, um, you know, three options, none of which are ideal. Um, one of it is mass forced deportation, which seems to be, you know, being pursued in part in Gaza. I mean, that's one way to understand the massive destruction. Um, another would be the status quo, which is apartheid. That is to say, you know, just having a complete double standard, of, you know, oppressive discriminatory regime that applies to the Palestinians in the occupied territory. Um, that, you know, has been in place for now a number of years. And Netanyahu, without calling it that, would ideally like to just continue it. Or the third alternative, which obviously Netanyahu doesn't want, is to turn the one state reality into an actual state and to give everybody within that state equal rights. Um, and the, the fact that that's even one of the options that people discuss is another factor driving him to try to reduce the Palestinian population as much as possible. And if they could take 2.2 million Palestinians off the demographic ledger sheet, that would be a good thing from Netanyahu's perspective. Okay, well, uh, because Hamas runs Gaza and by extension administers the small territory's healthcare system, you know, when we talk about justification, is the destruction of all elements of Hamas's governance structure, which is really what Netanyahu and his followers are wanting to achieve, is this even justifiable? I mean, you know, they're, they're denying people food, water, electricity, all the basics of life. They're effectively driving uh, a starvation policy, if you will, you know, on top of the bombing and the indiscriminate nature of the bombing. Uh, which we'll re return to a little bit later. But, you know, it's just um, incredible to think that in this day and age, in the 21st century, we could end up having a situation where a state, and I mean, I hate to say this, but from a historical perspective, one would always think that Israel's and the Jewish people's special role in international politics and history would have allowed this sort of thing never to happen. Whatever happened to that never again sort of claim, you know, it seems to now not be an absolute term. It's a a term that can be modified and used in whichever, whichever way you want. And if you happen to be on the right of Israeli politics, you can just basically ignore uh, all of the special attributes of the Jewish people and put forward a totally different international perception of what it is to be a Jewish person living in the Middle East. And I don't think that that's necessarily good for the Jewish people, not only living in the Middle East, but also internationally as well with the rise of anti-Semitism. Yeah, but John, I agree with you, but let, let me maybe explain this in slightly different terms. Um, there were, I think, you know, this is a bit of a simplification, but broadly speaking, I think there were two possible lessons drawn from the Holocaust. Um, one which, I share, um, and I should say that my, my, my father, you know, fled to Nazi Germany in July 1938 as a 12-year-old boy. So I, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of the evil that Hitler did. Um, and he was fortunate not to go in a concentration camp. He got out in time, but he was, um, you know, nonetheless, I grew up with this. And, you know, the one lesson is that the Jews were slaughtered because the norms against such conduct were weak, you know, and that at that era, you could get away with genocide. You know, the the the, the basic terms, the you know expectations of governments were not strong enough, and the emergence of the human rights movement is in many ways an effort to strengthen those norms to make it never again, so that you couldn't do this not just to the Jews but to anybody else. But that requires you know a strong human rights regime, and it requires sticking to that regime, not creating exceptions to it, because if there can be an exception for the Palestinians, there can be exceptions for the Jews, or, you know, you, you pick your minority. So um, that's one lesson. That's the lesson I've drawn.
But there's another lesson, which you might say is the Netanyahu lesson. And that is that the Jews were slaughtered by the Nazis because they were weak. And Netanyahu is determined to make the Jews strong. And, you know, he's done that. He's, he's built, you know, what is basically the superpower in the Middle East. And, I mean, nobody says Israel should be, you know, without a military. And it clearly lives in a hostile neighborhood. So there is, um, you know, definitely something to be said for a, a military defense. But Netanyahu's one-dimensional pursuit of that military defense, while basically throwing out the human rights norms that I think are also an important defense in this never again sense is I think, you know, part of what gives us October 7th because, you know, what Hamas did on October 7th shows what happens when the basic human rights norms are weak because how else do you explain somebody coming in and just slaughtering every civilian they could find and, you know, kidnapping a bunch and raping some women. And, you know, um, this is because, you know, Hamas treated Jews as not people, not entitled to rights. And, you know, for Netanyahu to turn around and do the same thing weakens those norms and makes these kind of atrocities more likely. So, you know, I don't think there's, you know, all the truth lies in one lesson or the other. There is a, com a combination that is probably the appropriate lesson. You do need a military defense. But you also need these human rights norms that, you know, have now been built for for 70 plus years since the Second World War. And Netanyahu would just jettison all of that. And I think that that one dimensional approach is a huge mistake. Um, it's, you know, it does nothing, as you point out, John, for Jews around the world. I mean, the military defense is, is just in Israel. Um, you know, it has certainly fueled anti-Semitism. But Netanyahu almost feels like, you know, who cares about the Jews around the rest of the world? You know, they... Um, they tend to be liberal and don't are not necessarily, you know, supporting Netanyahu. They're, um, I mean, in the United States, they vote Democratic. The Democrats are not, you know, 100% supporters of, of Netanyahu by any means. So in the U.S., Netanyahu has kind of um, aligned himself with APAC, which is, you know, a sort of small, very conservative slice of the American Jewish community, but mostly with Christian evangelicals who are all in the Republican Party. And, you know, he... Um, but he kind of feels like, well, you know, these Jews, they didn't make a lead to Israel. Um, it's their problem what happens um, abroad, you know, in, in their exile, as he would put it. You know, and that, and so his concern is just with the Jews in Israel. And that's why he makes common cause with, you know, overt anti-Semites like Hungary's Viktor Orban. Um, and they, you know, share a sort of, a, you know, a nationalist view. Um, they each jettison human rights. So they have that commonality. And... Netanyahu basically says, you know, who cares if you're an anti-Semite? You're a nationalist who supports, you know, my narrow vision of Israel. So we can be best buddies. Wow. All right. In our 39th episode, Kenneth, we spoke with Professor Dirk Moses on the genocide conundrum. Our discussion was very unsatisfactory for those wanting hard and fast proof of war crimes and genocide, broad terms that are very politically loaded. Essentially, Professor Moses said that all countries want to maintain the slipperiness of these terms, since one never knows when a country will, will be accused of them. Is this what we are seeing in Gaza with Israel? And if it is, can forensic proof stick Israel with the accusation of having committed war crimes in the court of law? You know, I would disagree that war crimes are slippery concepts. Um, they actually are, are defined in incredible detail. If you look at the Geneva Conventions, they're a thick book, you know, filled with rules. And now the essential rules are not all that complicated. You know, one is that you cannot fire on civilians or civilian targets. So, you know, what Hamas did on October 7th was firing on civilians, blatant war crime, that's not complicated. You know, when Israel deliberately blows up civilian cultural institutions like universities, um, when they destroy, you know, homes just gratuitously, um, those are war crimes. Now, the bulk of the war crimes that Israel is committing are, you know, maybe a little bit more complicated, but not that complicated. Maybe the simplest one is that you have a duty to allow humanitarian aid to a population in need. And Israel is blatantly flouting that rule by creating you know, one obstacle after another. And you hear these stories about how trucks are waiting you know, a month or more in Egypt to get through 
the Israeli clearance before they can deliver food to a starving population in Gaza. And Israel, you know, is allowing in drips and drabs of food, you know, just enough to prevent massive death, but not enough to prevent large scale hunger, imminent famine, um, because that's part of this negotiating strategy with Hamas. And indeed, you know, one of the major items Hamas is saying, you got to let in more food. And Israel is saying, well, only if you, you know, release more hostages. And so this is a very deliberate strategy, which is a war crime strategy. And even, you know, Kareem Khan, the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, has warned Israel that if it doesn't let in food at scale, you know, using a term that the UN Security Council had used, um, don't be surprised if they're accused of war crimes. And that'll be one of the easier charges for him to make. Now, you know, another one is um, indiscriminate bombardment. And there the rule is that, you know, if there's a, a military target you know, say in a civilian neighborhood, you've got to fire at the target. You can't fire at the neighborhood. But if you look at how Israel has been bombing, they've decimated whole neighborhoods. You can see these photographs of like entire neighborhoods that are just gone. Um, and again, that's, you know, pretty clearly evidence of indiscriminate bombardment. Um, the, another example of that, which sometimes kind of bleeds into a separate concept as I was describing earlier, of attacks that have disproportionate harm to civilians says that, you know, even as I mentioned, if there's a, you know, even a legitimate military target, you cannot fire upon it if the predictable consequences to civilians will be disproportionate. And here to illustrate how Israel has been doing this time and time again, it's been using these massive 2,000 pound bombs in heavily populated areas. Now, the US government these days refuses to use 2,000 pound bombs in urban areas. It refuses to use 1,000 pound bombs. It's very reluctant to use 500 pound bombs. Israel has been using the 2,000 pound bombs over and over and over again. And you, it, these just predictably decimate entire neighborhoods and kill anybody who's there. So, you know, why are they doing this? You know, again, it's, it's part of this, you know, indifference to Palestinian civilian life, part of this collective punishment, this view that, you know, we're going to make Palestinians as a whole pay, even though Palestinians in Gaza are as much the victims of Hamas as Israel is. So these are, you know, all examples of things that are not the least bit mushy. These are quite clear. And, um, you know, Kareem Khan has just hired a senior British military prosecutor to help, you know, accelerate the cases. And it, there's going to come a time when war crime charges are going to be filed, you know, against Hamas for October 7th, um, for, you know, some of the indiscriminate rocket attacks, but against Israel as well, and Israeli officials for the kinds of war crimes that I've described. Do you think that, do you think that Israel's broken legal precedent at some point, you know, I mean, the international community tends to not go too hard against Israel, um, the United States in particular. I mean, yes, the Biden administration has been overtly critical, but it has always pulled its criticism at the last minute. Uh, at the moment, the uh, Biden administration wants to put forward the idea of creating a, a an artificial peer uh, in order to um, you know bring in supplies to Gaza. Although I can't see how the current Netanyahu government would welcome such a development. How do you see this move across? You know, I, I, I fr from a military perspective, I can already imagine. Uh, another war crime happening with either the IDF or Hamas setting off an explosion near or on the artificial pier and blaming the other side for it, and the Americans just packing up and leaving the uh, the, the Gazans to themselves. I mean, it's it's possible. I'm not saying it's likely, but you can see it happen with the current ebb and flow of the conflict as it's currently being conceived. Yeah. I mean, in terms of you know this plan to um to bring by sea food to Gaza. Um, and we saw just, you know, this, this Spanish American chef doing that just recently, um, these airdrops, you know, Netanyahu can live with that because those do not begin to replace trucks. If you look at the amount of food that, you know, Biden is talking about delivering, um, it's about the equivalent of 20 trucks. And, you know, to put that in perspective, there were 500 trucks a day that were entering Gaza before the war. So it's, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. And, and even if they do this every day, you know, let's say we're talking about 200 trucks, you know, um, that doesn't begin to approximate 500 trucks a day. 
And so, you know, Netanyahu has never completely shut off the food. He hasn't wanted people dying in the streets. He just wants them hungry. He wants them near starvation. And so if he's got to, you know, placate Biden by making him do these incredibly inefficient, expensive airdrops or sea deliveries, he can live with that because everybody says, all the humanitarian actors on the ground, that that does not begin to replace the trucks. And Netanyahu can keep, can keep obstructing the trucks, you know, finding some little item in the truck they don't want to let in, you know, scissors or something, and send the truck back to the end of the line to wait another 30 days. You know, they're, they're expert at these sorts of delays. And, and so that's why it, it really doesn't, you know, the, these modest non-truck delivery approaches are not going to be sufficient. Now, you also talk about, you know, Biden's broader approach to Israel. And I do have to give Biden credit. He's been saying the right thing around pushing Netanyahu to take greater, greater care in not bombing civilians. He's been pushing Netanyahu to allow in more food and humanitarian aid. Um, he's been pushing for some step toward a two-state solution. Now, Netanyahu has been basically thumbing his nose at all of that. Where Biden falls short is that he has not been willing to back up that good rhetoric with any consequence. Hmm. And so he continues to send $3.8 million, billion dollars in annual military aid to Israel. He continues you know, regularly to sell arms to Israel. He continues to veto any serious UN Security Council resolution. He continues to you know, speak against the International Court of Justice genocide case or the International Criminal Court prosecutions. And so you know, he basically is providing political cover while he militarily facilitates the same war crimes that he's denouncing. And you know, Netanyahu basically has been willing to say, you know, I'll live with your rhetoric. I understand you've got to placate your, your political base. Just keep the, the money and the arms coming. And Biden has. So we go back to what we uh, what I raised earlier, and that is that there is no real international pressure for Netanyahu to alter his behavior, giving him basically a free hand to conduct the war any which way it, it he likes. Are we now left in the unenviable position of having to wait for this war to go over its natural course, however the outcome, whether or not it leads to another Nakba, and then when things finally settle down, we can start asking questions, maybe some difficult questions at that. Or are we going to be seeing something else from an unexpected source? Because at this point in time, you know, the ball really is in Netanyahu's court and everyone else is just backing away. You're right. They're saying all the right things, you know, at least in certain quarters, but they're not prepared to pull the rug from underneath the Netanyahu government as punishment or at least as a sufficient deterrent for him not to continue pursuing his military action in Gaza. Well, I have to say, John, the, um, the political pressure on Netanyahu is mounting. Um, I don't know how much this was covered in Australia, but um, this past week, um, Senator Chuck Schumer, who is the Senate Majority Leader, who is actually the most senior elected Jewish official in American history, you know, a long, long supporter of Israel, gave this speech where he basically said Netanyahu should resign. You know, that, that what he's doing is, is a catastrophe. And, you know, for somebody like Schumer to say that was just remarkable. You know, it's the last person you'd expect to start criticizing Netanyahu. And then Biden immediately said that was a good speech. You know, so it kind of gave his imprimatur to it. And so we are seeing, um, you know, a shift in the political spectrum. And I think this is somewhat of necessity because Biden, who you know, has tended to view Israel in, you know, partly in personal terms, I think he's very attached to Israel, but partly in political terms, he has an election coming up against Trump, and he's very focused on um, sort of the movable middle, you know, the, the relatively small number of independents who will decide the presidential election in November. Um, he's been fixated there, which has led him to sort of not do anything that would give the Republicans talking points against him on Israel. In the meantime, he's losing his progressive base. And whether it's, you know, Arab Americans or younger progressive Democrats, many of them are so horrified by what Biden is doing, his, his de facto support for Israel, despite his rhetoric, that they are not threatening to vote for Trump, that's not very likely, but threatening not to vote, which effectively is the same thing. 
<laughs> and suddenly, um, you know, Biden is becoming attentive to this threat, as are others in the Democratic Party. So there is a shift there. I should say, you know, in um, in Australia, there's been an evolution with respect to UNRWA, the um, leading UN humanitarian agency that services, you know, Palestinian refugees throughout the region, but is the by far and away the humanitarian agency best able to deliver food within Gaza. It has, you know, the most employees. And because Israel came out and said, oh, a dozen UNRWA employees took part in October 7th, um, everybody stopped funding. They suspended funding. You know, even though UNRWA immediately did the right thing. They fired people. They launched an investigation. Um, Israel has not been forthcoming with its evidence. And what's really going on here is that Netanyahu is pursuing kind of a two-part strategy because he's long hated UNRWA. Yet on the one hand, yes, he wants to kill an agency that can feed people because that furthers his starvation strategy in Gaza. And second, he has this naive view that if you um, kill UNRWA, which also beyond delivering food, it provides education and medical care to Palestinian refugees throughout the region, that once you get rid of UNRWA, Palestinian refugees will forget that they're Palestinian refugees, which is highly unlikely. But this is, you know, Netanyahu's way of trying to not deal with the 1948 Nakba, not deal with the descendants of the 600,000 Palestinians who were forcibly expelled from Israel at its founding. And, you know, the sad thing is that Australia, the United States, a number of European countries effectively endorsed Netanyahu's uh -oh. incredibly wrong-headed approach to UNRWA. Now, Australia has, has not backed off. They've resumed funding, which is the right thing to do. The U.S. government has not yet resumed funding. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from the U.S., we're speaking with visiting professor at Princeton and former executive director of Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Roth. Uh, Kenneth, can you walk us through forensic architecture? How is this form of investigation helping to understand who is doing what on the ground in Gaza? Well, forensic architecture is very good um, at using, you know, so-called open source investigation and and um, architectural reconstruction to try to understand um, what is happening. And it's a good way of, of visualizing the massive destruction that is taking place. Because, you know, you, you see these pictures, you, you know, you see entirely devastated neighborhoods, but um, forensic architecture is very good at helping to bring that to life, to sort of, you know, show what was this, um, you know, what was this building, what was this neighborhood, what was this part of the city before Israel destroyed it. And so, you know, I view their recent report as, you know, a, 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 an important addition to the accumulating evidence of the incredible, you know, overreaction militarily of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, to um, the Hamas threat. How accurate is this form of investigation? I mean, when we look at this, uh, well, dare I say, politically charged war, you know, you're going to have people from the other side saying, ah, this is all a left wing conspiracy and this is all nonsense. And the IDF is conducting itself extremely well. And we, we're going out of our way not to hit civilians and we're giving pamphlets into areas where we're about to bomb. So we give civilians enough time to escape. You know, there is this countervailing notion from the Netanyahu government that they are doing the right thing and all they're doing is really defending the state of Israel from the horrors of Hamas. You know, a lot of that has cut through. A lot of that message has cut through, irrespective of how outsiders may have a, a different view. Um, and this kind of message is, well, I don't know, part and parcel of the problem. I mean, in terms of having forensic evidence that is scientifically based and able to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt versus political accusations of a nation state that probably has its own tools whereby it can also present evidence of things that have been done. How does this now become a matter of he said, she said in the in the whole political gamut? Yeah. Well, it's very important to look at concrete cases, which is part of what friends and architecture and others do. Um, I mean, as you note, the Netanyahu government has certain standard responses. So one is, oh, we give warnings, you know. Um, 
And, and it's true that they don't want to kill everybody. They are happy to kill sufficient numbers to send everybody else fleeing. And, and the warnings are not the old targeted ones, like, oh, this building's going to be hit, move away. Rather, it's like, move away from northern Gaza. You know, we're going to destroy all of northern Gaza. And, and then they bomb in the path along the way. They don't create any reception centers in the south. And now the people who have gone to the south, including 1.4 million people harboring in Rafa, Netanyahu's saying, well, we're now we're going to attack Rafa, so you got to move again. But where? You know, there's no place safe. Um, so this idea of giving warning, you've got to look at the context. And it's 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 not um, a humanitarian gesture. It's just part of the effort to, you know, cleanse out the Palestinian population. The other thing that Netanyahu likes to say is, oh, you know, human shields, human shields. They'll repeat that ad infinitum. You know, and yes, sometimes Smas does use human shields. But, you know, as I indicated, the, the requirement of proportional attack says that even in a case of human shields, you cannot attack if the consequences to civilians are going to be um, are going to be larger. And so if it means, you know, they're going to destroy an entire hospital because of Hamas presence, you can't do that. If it means that they're going to, you know, use a 2,000 pound bomb in a neighborhood just because there might be a tunnel underneath, you can't do that. And so the human shield mantra just ignores the reality of how this war is being fought. And to get past the rhetoric, as you know, because you know, some people just don't look that closely and they say, oh, you know, we're going to believe Israel. Um, when you start looking at how it actually plays out, you realize that these defenses offered by Netanyahu look pretty empty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, buried under all of this, of course, is October 7. I mean, Hamas committed a ghastly crime. Arguably, there was proof of plenty of Hamas's actions. Why is there no countervailing outrage internationally about this one act? Was Israel's invasion of Gaza so disproportionate as to almost diminish the culpability of Hamas for October 7? Well, I think at first people were outraged by October 7th right. and people's hearts went out to, to Israel. I mean, I wrote a piece in The Guardian just a few days after October 7th and basically said, look, you know, right now, Israel, you have the moral high ground. You know, everybody sympathizes with you, but don't do what George W. Bush did after September 11th, where again, everybody was sympathetic to the United States. And he then responded in this incredibly abusive way to the point that now all people could think about was, you know, his invasion of Iraq and his use of torture and his detention endlessly in Guantanamo. And, and the US, you know, lost the moral high ground. And I said, don't do that. But Netanyahu has done precisely that. And so, I mean, yes, October 7th remains horrible, um, but, when people look at the utter devastation that this powerful military has visited upon Gaza, um, they are focusing on that and understand. Final question, Kenneth. Do you think that Israel feels it can get away with the scale of its counterattack against Hamas because Hamas is a non-state actor residing in a territory that has no recognition as a nation? If so, had Hamas and Gaza been integrated within a Palestinian national territory, would this have made any legal or ethical difference on how the IDF would have conducted itself in countering an attack like that of October 7? I'm not sure it would have made any difference. I mean, the one thing worth noting is that uh, even though you know Palestine is not a state, it is recognized by the UN General Assembly as an observer state. And that is sufficient to give it um, the ability to join the International Criminal Court and to confer jurisdiction on the International Criminal Court. And so the court has jurisdiction over any war crime committed by a Palestinian. So that would be you know, what Hamas did in, um, in Southern Israel or any war crime committed on Gaza territory, which would include you know, both the indiscriminate firing by Hamas and Islamic Jihad, but in addition, the Israeli indiscriminate bombardment, the disproportionate attacks, the starvation as a method of war, the attacks on hospitals, I mean, all the things we've been talking about. And so, you know, I, I wish that um, Korean Khan had been going more quickly because I think, you know, earlier charges would save lives. It would, I think, have an effect to deter Netanyahu because he'll become a global pariah. But um, that time will come. And, um, and the fact that, you know, Israel doesn't recognize Palestine makes no difference because the judges of the International Criminal Court have already said that, yes, there's jurisdiction. And so the war crimes charges that emerge from this investigation are going to stand. 
Kenneth, thanks for joining us and for sharing your insights on The Focus. Thank you very much for having me, John. Former Executive Director of Human Rights Watch and Visiting Professor at Princeton, Kenneth Roth. And to our audience, thanks for tuning in to The Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find The Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages and on Twitter, or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the Media Center drop-down menu and hitting Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks Thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart and to the team at the Ozcast Network. We hope that you'll join us again as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus. Mm -hmm.